Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. I always like these interviews and these on-air conversations when we have our friends who have come back a second and even sometimes a third time. (laughs) It's three for you, Rob, or four? Three. Three, yes. Well, welcome back to the studio. We are very excited today to work with the crew with AZ Next Workforce Development Partnership, talking about all things partnership. So let me first start by introducing our featured guest. We have Laura, Laura, excuse me, Laura Hemingway, who is the founder and principal of Paradigm Solutions, LLC. Welcome back as well. Well, thank you, Karen, for uh, having all of us. And I want to thank you, too, um, for all you give back to the community in the show. It's just, it's such a treasure of of information. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to have you back. It's been, I think you said over a year. Does that sound right? It's been a little over a year, yes. Well, good. I'm excited. I'm thrilled that we're still having a conversation around workforce development and how you are supporting people in that growth and looking forward to hearing more about what's going on for you lately. I already just kind of gave a quick shout out to Rob Bilo, who's the program director at AZ Next Workforce Development Partnership. Was it AZ Tech Council we just had you on? Or Yeah, it was just two weeks ago at AZ <laughs> Tech Council. I was looking for my name on the covered parking spot. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> and on the back of your chair here in yeah, the studio, exactly, right? Exactly. I think you got to be here more frequently than that. Uh, Let's see if we okay, can make I'll that work happen. On that. <laughs> That's right. So, Steve Zalstra and I co host that show together. It's AZ Tech Council's AZ Tech Cast. And I knew, I already knew Laura had invited you to come and, and join us for this conversation. So I'm glad you were able to make make room to help us continue to get the word out about the great work you're doing with AZ Next Workforce. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. And you, I don't know who thought to bring this wonderful lady over here <laughs> to my right, but Paloma Greenwald is first time in the studio with us. Correct. And Paloma, you are an AZ Next participant. Do we call you a recipient, a participant? What's the right phrase? Lucky gal? <laughs> Indeed. Sure. Yeah. yeah, definitely the the beneficiary. Very good. I don't want to put you on the spot, oh, but I'd fine. love for you to tell us what you're doing and why the AZ Next has been so important to you. And then we'll kind of back up the train a little bit and let these two share a little bit about why they're here and their role in, in working with you. Yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll go back in time, maybe just about 18 months. And I found myself in something of a vulnerable transition stage. Uh, My husband, after his 32-year career, which I had spent about 27 of them with him, you know, he retired. It was a natural progression. He had achieved his goals, and he made the decision that uh, we needed to prioritize my dad, who was on hospice care here in, in town, as well as my senior in high school. And we wanted the stability at that moment that we hadn't had as a standard for many, many years. So he chose to retire, and I found myself stumped. <laughs> Who am I? What's my purpose? What What am I going to support? Because the military gave us that purpose, and we were very proud of it. We were happy to engage in that. And the local installation initiatives that I was involved with still mattered. That didn't change overnight. And so I threw my name out there. There's an organization in the state uh, with a great reputation called the uh, Coalition of Military Families, the Arizona Coalition. And I think they've got billboards all over town that say uh, be connected, and they've got resources, um, you know, by probably the hundreds. And I, so I, I submitted my name as interested in receiving some of their benefits, and probably within a month, AZ Next contacted me with the opportunity for a free educational program that I absolutely jumped on. Incredible. Yeah. And so what what are you studying? So this was about a four or five month long program yep. for business analysts. Okay. So good. So we kind of just jumped right in the middle of the lake with that. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Now, for our curious listeners, let's back up a little bit. And Rob, would you start by sharing with us what your role is, of course, as director, and then where you're housed and the partnership you're so good about giving us the the, um, the flyover. <laughs> Share that with us, if you would, please. Sure, sure. Um, AZ Next is the Arizona Workforce Development Partnership at ASU. And we are a U.S. Department of Labor grant-funded program, and our goal is to create the sustainable workforce training infrastructure for all the high-tech jobs that are coming to the state and the region and, in fact, the whole country. So we focus on the areas of IT, cybersecurity, and advanced manufacturing. And the way it works is basically we go out to our industry partners and ask them 
what sort of skills are you looking for in your workforce? We then use the fantastic resources we have at ASU to put together training programs like our Introduction to Business Analysis course that Paloma went through and recruit folks to uh, go through the programs, uh, help them finish them out, get them certified if we can, and then hopefully get them, you know, into a good paying position somewhere. That's really what we want to try to do. We're not a training program. We're a jobs program. Mm -hmm. And is there a cost involved? Absolutely no cost to our participants at all. I knew the answer to that question (laughs) (laughs) because you were here two weeks ago and even before that. And I'm blown away. So exciting. Yeah. And what a great example that you've been willing to share with us. So thank you for joining Mm -hmm. us today. Laura, where do you fit in? Where I fit in I was introduced to the AZ Next program at an organization uh, dinner th- that I belong to uh, where the dean, associate dean, executive leaders at ASU presented the AZ Next program uh, to the organization. I'll go ahead and give it a plug, SIM, Society, Information, Society for Information Management. And I immediately jumped on the bandwagon there wanting to be involved because I just found the applicability of the courses to be so widespread. So I was immediately volunteered, and I am a guest lecturer for the business analyst cohort. I believe we're headed into our fourth one. Yes, we are. And so back in June, I'll be speaking with the candidates again. And my main focus is on the soft skills, the, the tool, the toolkit, and how to really capitalize on that in your role as a business analyst, because you are the change agent. You are changing the organization. People are looking at you as either the angel or the devil, depends <laughs> on their point of view. And you need to have those soft skills to be successful. But we will get into that a little bit later. Paloma was in the very first cohort, and she reached out to me afterwards, and uh, we have been in contact since then. I guess you would say in kind of a mentor. Oh, absolutely. Mentor, yeah. Kind yeah. of yeah. relationship. Can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty humble when it comes to those kinds yes, of things. Yes, you are. <laughs> and so uh, we've been in contact ever since, and I felt that she was just a great example of the diversity of the types of students that AZ Nick re- represents. And just her her skill set and knowledge and how she was able to apply this to her initiatives that she's working on now. So hence the uh, invitation to Paloma. That's perfect. Thank you for thinking mm-hmm. to that. And, and Karen, if I could just add, I just wanted to say that Laura is actually one of the most popular of our guest speakers in any of our courses. Uh, the reviews that we always get after her after her sessions are out of the ballpark. I love that. Do you think it's the topic or do you think it's Laura? I think it's Laura. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> and it's a great, I mean, I, it's it, of all topics, that'd probably be the area that I would be focusing on too. And it's so critical that we bring that into any type of, of work-related conversations, the how do we show up in the world mm-hmm. and navigate all the things that come at us, right? So thank you for that shout out for Laura. That's important. Uh, Paloma, talk a little bit about the skills that you learned from the technology-based courses mm-hmm. and how that's assisting you, and where is it showing up for you today? Right. So originally, I came into it as an ASU graduate in nursing. So I've been a nurse for decades and enjoyed that process. It's been fantastic. Uh, But I definitely wanted to see at this juncture of opportunity, you know, let me explore a little bit. So I I took on this season of exploration Mm -hmm. and just had a really open mind that nursing would be great, but it doesn't have to stay in nursing. Mm -hmm. And so every week that we had instructors come along, um, I really wanted to dig in a deep dive and just learn all about the coursework, but but the individuals, the, the other guest speakers. And so along that path, I recognized, you know, there's a big overlap here. I I don't think I had the confidence until the self confidence until Laura came along, but I had been exposed to so much of the tech side, right? I, I, in electronic medical records that have been going on really for decades, that's a daily process that nursing staff interact with. Of course, looking into the future, it, I think nurses very much deserve the space to help um, influence what um, technology like the Internet of Things, the wearables, you know, the, these watches and other opportunities to monitor biometrics. Luckily, I had already been doing interviews for telehealth in my daily work life. So I had more technical skills than I had been giving myself credit for. And then the business analyst program 
pointed out that that role as a nurse could be the liaison to communicate the needs of the tech side Mm -hmm. to the leadership of whatever organization, as Laura was saying, to, to make change, to find that optimal state. And so, yeah, it, I think there's cross-application in really essentially any industry, don't you think, Rob? Absolutely, yeah. Business analyst, as you both mentioned, is so important not only to, you know, the strictly business applications of it, but it the tools that you discover in that field can be used in engineering, in technology. It really is very widespread. I'm curious. Oh, go, Laura, go ahead. No, I just wanted to pop in a little bit here. Paloma, if you if you don't mind, uh, she has a great story. Of, uh, she, uh, Paloma works a lot with the food bank on the base. And uh, she was uh, in introducing a new uh, right. option there. And if you could just share Yeah, that. sure. Yes. So, yes, that was the nursing side of technology. <laughs> but in my nonprofit work, um, the food bank on Luke Air Force Base is in an expansion phase. And so we have four small shelves that are feeding about 40 to 60 families a month. Mm. But through generous donors, um, we've got a little bigger pot of money to play with and a dedicated building to rehab, to renovate. And so I recognized, thanks to AZ Next, that this was an opportunity to engage stakeholders, to capture all kinds of opinions and needs and um, elicit these requirements out of all the people who have a stake in this food bank, from clients on up to executive level, from different food organizations that were going to donate to us. So the concept really broadened my mind, but gave me the tools of, of, you know, the vocabulary, how to name it, how to achieve these relationships with the different stakeholders. So um, ideally, that's the person to person, but I'm also on the search for what type of software are we going to use that's going to capture our operations so that we have data that turns around and makes impact statements that come back to us in the form of ongoing grants, right? So if we do this good to great at the beginning, I think it's going to pay dividends for that community, which is very needy, frankly. They, it, there's a big need, and we want to we want to improve that. Am I right in thinking that when students come to you and they're ready to learn and they're participating, just based on Paloma's story, how often do you find that you're really kind of connecting those dots for them? You've kind of described that, you know, you've been influenced by the instruction and and the way the program. Are you asking questions? I would imagine so. But I'm also thinking you are listening as guides and so are your instructors and you're saying, have you thought about this, this, and this? And then it becomes expansive. Absolutely. All of our courses are very much in flux all of the time. And one of the things that we always try to do is we try to listen to our participants, get feedback from them on how was the experience, what can we do to make it better, and then we modify the course based on that. But one of the things that we really try to focus on is that when you join AZ Next, you become a member of the AZ Next family. So we want to make sure that you know, you have all the tools that you need to either go out and start a new career or go to the next level in your current career. So we do work closely with the students. We do ask them, you know, the questions about what else can we do to help you? What are your interest? How can we improve the overall experience? So, yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah, and how, yeah, have you thought about, I, I would imagine that that's probably a conversation that you all, you, you, you can see from the perspective that you've had career-wise and influence-wise as people come through this program, what, the last four years already? Is that what you said? Two years. Two years. Mm-hmm. Two years. Four cohorts, right? Four mm-hmm. cohorts. Okay. That when folks come, that you can see a path that's laying out for them. It may not be the path they choose, but at least you can say, have you thought about X, Y, Z, and, and hand them that, uh, that guidance. That's phenomenal. Yeah, and we learn from every cohort. So. It, sounds, it sounds like it, and that's critical, isn't it, right? Mm-hmm. That's just all part of, I know where the two of you spend a lot of your, your professional time is in process improvement mm-hmm. and making sure that people are, are uh, able to give you feedback. I love that you're dipping your toe in the nonprofit world, staying uh, as an advocate for military and military family. Have you then been somebody that has been sharing and, and singing the praises for AZ Next as it relates back to military families? How do, how do you see where AZ Next can continue to help our military? Wow. So if I have a passion, I, I have to sort of shamelessly plug uh, the Military Spouse Professional Network. That's uh, So I, I lead this group of about 650 spouses out of 
the, really the Phoenix metro area, right? So Luke Air Force Base is um, just the, the title of it. Yeah. I'm not sure anyone in the country, really, if they understood 20 to 30 percent unemployment rate in a particular group. I, I just don't think we would tolerate that. And that's pretty much been the standard for a good, well, since it's been tracked, which is about 12 years. And it's nearly intransigent. It has hardly budged. Efforts um, are very successful for the veteran community, so the service member that has separated, and maybe they need some adjustment in translating their transferable skills onto a resume, whatever. But the spouse community, it's a far more complicated process. We, we can't necessarily claim the same experience, continuous experience in the workforce. So AZ Next has a huge benefit to people who, well, one, in my case, need the connection to people to say, you you do have value. <laughs> there is a confidence there. You have a contribution to give that is meaningful. And then her introductions into the greater community built my personal network. And so so it just expands exponentially, right? This this network amongst ourselves. And so as I lead the group, I have access to social media that allows me to amplify the AZ Next message. So whenever events come up, when there's deadlines, applications, absolutely <laughs> those those six, well, six hundred and fifty spouses now, we, wow. we have great metrics. Um where even just this week, uh, I was able to confirm that there's 500 active members out of that group, and 300 of them view daily posts. So, yeah, I, I think we've got we've got some good traction. People are hearing it. People Listen are reading to that it. business analyst in there. <laughs> you know, in there. I, I want to also give a shout out to the Arizona Coalition right. of Military Families, which is the organization that connected Paloma to yeah. us. They are one of our closest partners, and. One of the great, I, I'd say the, the greatest thing about that organization is that they do work with the whole family. Mm -hmm. It's not just the transitioning veteran. Mm -hmm. It's their spouse. It's their children. And uh, as Paloma pointed out, you know, there's a definite need there. And we've had some really good success of spouses coming from that organization in our courses. So good. While we have the attention on you, can you share a little bit more uh, this time around, because I know we talked about it last time, about the benefits that companies receive in utilizing AZ Next? Well, again, because we're a grant-funded program, uh, we're the, the number one benefit, obviously, is cost savings. We can use our grant funds to design our programs, to hire instructors to teach them, uh, or in Laura's case, to volunteer. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... We also find that, you know, our type of program is how you build your own talent rather than have to go out and buy it. We can custom design a program for a company that is looking for a specific skill set and even customize it down to that company's particular corporate needs. Mm. Uh, so we can put that program together. What we found is that people who go through programs like this are going to be much more loyal to that company. It's fantastic for the trainees because they get a chance to try out the company and the company gets a chance to try out the trainee. So it really is a win-win situation. And again, we found that the people who go through these programs uh, again, turn out to be much loyal, much more loyal to the company. They don't move around as much. They're most definitely, uh, the feedback that we get from our companies is that these people are much quicker in the uptake as far as being ready and prepared to do the job faster. And again, we can do all this at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. hmm. If somebody is interested, I don't want to wait till the end of the show, but we'll ask it again. If if there is a leader in a company that's interested in learning more, do they just reach out to the, on they, the website or reach out to you? What makes most the They most can sense? reach us on our website, which is www.aznext.pipelineaz.com, mm -hmm. or they can uh, send an email directly to us at aznext.asu.edu. Very good. Hmm. I love it. Tell us more about why you continue to come back. That's year two, I think, right? Because you were uh, obviously already an instructor when Paloma came through the mm -hmm. with the first cohort. What uh, What is so special about this for you? And then help us better understand Paradigm uh, Solutions and, and what you're doing. So what's so special about this is the, the diversity, the students, uh, I guess, 
beneficiaries. Is <laughs> yeah, I love that. It. Uh, that's a great, great term. Uh, just the diversity of it and the questions that are asked. The diversity is such a. I, I, I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna use a cliche. Hot topic right now. It is at everywhere that we go and every webinar, any symposium. I, and I, I just want to share a personal story on why I keep coming back to AZ Next and and uh, kind of a an energy lifting thing that I just went through. Uh, I have been in IT for 30 plus years, a mind numbing number of years. And my entire career has always been heads down, head butting, just always the only female in the room, very difficult, always striving to prove yourself. I kind of empathize a lot with some of these students that come in because they're coming in with adverse situations and they're trying to find some self-motivation, something to, to rise them. So last week, I was privileged enough to be at a summit for chapter leaders, a nationwide summit, and I have to brag a little bit. I was nominated as a leader, chapter leader of the year award. Wow. Thank you. And so chapter was, for, for what? I'm sorry. So representing Arizona, but it was a nationwide um, what was, honor. What was what, what is the group, though? It was oh, Society for Information Management. Well, that's pretty big. Pretty big deal. Congratulations. Yeah, so Thank really you for exciting. sharing. Yes. And it was a one-day summit, uh, and then it was immediately followed by the Sim Women Leadership Summit. And I was telling them the story. I remember walking in the door the night of the welcoming event and immediately feeling this sense of warmth around me. Just, it was overwhelming. It was about half men and half women, but it was all people that you've seen on Zoom calls. Uh -huh. like, finally, we're together. We're all in the same room, finally, right? And then the Tuesday, it was the women leadership. That day, it hit me. I how hard this has been for me, how overwhelmingly oppressive the universe has been in the IT for women. And it felt like the weight of the world just lifted off my shoulder and I could see things clearly. And I was surrounded by a room of women just like me. And I appreciated the warmth and the nurturing that was in that group. So it simultaneously made me angry that I had to put up with what I put up with the thirty last, last 30 years. But it also gave me the energy to move forward and to give back more. So in that feeling that I had that day and, and sometimes falling into imposter syndrome and all of that, it's a strong empathy to the candidates in AZ Next because a lot of them have hit you know, they, they don't know where they want to go. They've, they've hit walls along the way. They don't know where that nurturing is going to come from. They need just a little bit of um, for encouragement to get them in that right direction. And I, I felt that full steam last Tuesday. And it just provided me just an, an extra empathy for what they already had. I just wanted to share that story because it just drove me to be more fierce in supporting women in IT and supporting the diversity there. I so. can't help but think that's why you've been through <laughs> that experience all, all these years, because that's how you now show up, right? As you're a mentor and a guide and, mm -hmm. and a coach and a consultant and all the things that you do, you have been able to let somebody, you know, take a look behind the curtain and say, I've been here I've, or been or I've been somewhere similar and it, and you've got this, right? Yes. I just I just it just struck me in such a different frame of mind, yeah. I guess, that day. Well, congratulations. Well, yeah, it was it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. So I'm gonna start Sim Women here in the Valley. I'm very excited about that. So there isn't a there isn't a group here yet. It's not a Sim Women, no. Nope. Now there is. Now there is. <laughs> All right. And for our listeners who would want to get involved in that, do they reach out to you directly? Absolutely. Please feel free to do so. Uh, our introductory sessions will begin third quarter, and we're going to open it up to all uh, that would like to attend. Uh, Sim Women National invites both men and women, so you don't have to be a Sim member to uh, be able to uh, reach out on our first couple of meetings. We'll recruit you later for that. <laughs> um, so just reach out to me. Via, probably LinkedIn is the best way. Laura Hemenway, H-E-M-E-N-W-A-Y. And I'll have my Calendly uh, updated here shortly, and feel free to schedule some time. 
I love it. You spoke a little bit about IT uh, and diversity. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit, and I would love for all three of you to chime in, about some of the shifts that are taking place as we're more aware of how we want to become more inclusive and offer opportunities for everybody to have an, you know, an opportunity in the workforce. What are you seeing, and how can we as business owners continue to support moving in that direction? I mean, we're talking veterans, we're talking mm-hmm. disabled, we're, t- you know, under privileged communities, whatever it is, we know that we have to make sure that we're creating opportunities like this to provide people with opportunities for development. The research is now coming to fruition. Um, We had pre-COVID and then during COVID with the great resignation, now people starting to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And so all of the studies are starting to actually be able to provide accurate information on what it's like to have diversity or women in your leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, A Harvard Business Review did did a study on the VC venture capitalists. And if you had just added, increased your female leaders by 10%, it also directly related to a 10% increase in revenues. Kenzie showed that if you increased your leadership and your females in your leadership, that it brought in 20% more revenue than your peers. So all of those studies are, are really showing this information to provide just real business dollars and real business value to that. So something that you might have kind of slept off to the side or ignored or whatever are now showing hard numbers and hard values uh, and benefits back to organizations. So people are paying attention. We've needed it. Yeah, Rob. Just want to relate a story uh, kind of related to what Laura just said. Um, We've been working very hard recently on putting together a technology summit to talk about AZNX and the programs that we can provide to all the IT companies out there. Uh, we were It's been fantastic. We've been working with Steve at uh, the AZ Tech Council to put all this together. He put out some fantastic marketing material. It's coming up in June. We were just really excited and happy that this was all happening. And I got a text last Friday from Laura. She says, Rob, this looks like a great uh, opportunity, but there's an issue. And it's like, have you noticed something similar about who's on the panel? Good girl. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I thought, you know what, Laura? You are absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And I just think that that, that that reinforces the fact that we need to be vigilant all the time, that we don't fall into these traps. I mean, it wasn't conscious. We were just working really hard to try to get this thing to happen, and we missed it. Mm-hmm. And so we're taking some steps now to see if we can correct that a little bit, mm-hmm. get some folks, get some women on the panel. And so I think it's important that we just maintain that vigilance and we don't slip into these traps yep. that it's so easy to do. It, it, the unconscious bias. Yes. It's, it's so prevalent. And, but that's how, you know, we've got, we got the boomers to the Gen Zs and you know, all these different ages all growing up with different levels of of diversity and acceptance into our peers, but everyone still falls into this unconscious bias. And you have to really, I'm in organizations right now. I'm still the only female. I'm still, and I just, and these, and these, another follow-up story, sorry. And, and these men are just looking at me, I'll go, she just shut up already. (laughs) But it was really interesting in that women's summit that I was just talking about, one of my male colleagues was in the room and he started listening to all these stories. He said, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. He said, I used to think it was just all kind of just whining, you know, whining or whatever. And he said, and he, he's, he actually said, men can be real jerks sometimes. <laughs> and that's a, that's a quote. Yeah. And I know that's really candid and straightforward. And I just had to laugh. And I said, yes, at times that is, that is, that is correct. But I thought it was just kind of funny that a man said that about himself. (laughs) Well, it it goes back to what Rob was saying, just being Mm self-aware and professionally aware Mm -hmm. to move the needle on the dial. If we we just leave it to how things are always done, we're not going to change. And and what I love so much about the, the story that you shared is the camaraderie and the relationship that you two have built through this opportunity to work together through AZ Next meant that you felt safe and comfortable, and even if you didn't, I know you would do it anyway, <laughs> but to reach out to, to Rob and say, look, hey, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me let you, let me help you see this through the lens I'm seeing this through because I won't be the only one. And, and thank goodness, Rob, you're like, oh my gosh, receptive. 
and I know Steve Zelser is the same. I, we've had many conversations around this and yeah. how can we close the gap, widen the opportunities, and, and, um, and, and create a new narrative for how we work together. Anything to add to the conversation? I'm surely well, thinking you do. If you'll allow me stepping a little outside the box. Please. So I think I think we've established it's just an imperative that this be affordable, that the access to these programs be really on a short-term basis and be affordable. But if you're open, <laughs> I think perhaps a child care voucher would make a fantastic mm. difference to women in particular who find themselves interested and maybe one hand, one hand tied behind their back in their efforts to to really show up fully into this kind of coursework. And Paloma, that is available through AZ Next. Mm, it is. Yes. We need to amplify that message. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> count on it being done. <laughs> Link arms and let's go. That's fantastic. See, yeah. look. Yeah, having raised two sons, I, I wasn't familiar with that. And so that's a disservice, right? We just need to be better better aware and, and communicate it. Yeah. Hmm. I would like to go back to Laura if I can. Chat GPT. Oh my <laughs> Seems goodness. like a random conversation, but I, I see it in my notes here. So, yes. and, and AI specifically, what are you noticing that the, the impact this has? Did we cover that? I don't think we really covered that in our segment, we, did we? we? We talked about it a little bit. Yeah. The universe of AI is changing so quickly that no matter what I say at this moment in time, in an hour, it will be obsolete. <laughs> In a study, just in the last six months, over 1,200 new AI offerings have been uh, put out there. So it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's not going away. How, it's not going away. But nor is it the panacea that everyone is mm. making it. There's a lot of, I guess, mistrust or just maybe discomfort with the fact that taking advantage of these tools will replace some people's jobs. And in some very direct manners, maybe it's true. So let's say you're a developer, but your job is to be creative and you're, you're a problem solver. So you're trying to say, okay, here's the requirements that are given to me. Here's our business goal. So how am I going to code this? How am I going to make this happen? So what it does do is it enables them to be more of that critical thinker, mm -hmm. that strategic thinker, and allow these tools to actually maybe do the more direct type of task of that. But it doesn't replace the person. It doesn't replace that critical thinking. I'll take the AZ Next business analyst course as an example. I ran through an example of a process that I improved for a Fortune 10 program, uh, a company that was getting ready for an IPO. And I said, okay, what's, what's it going to come back with? What's it going to tell me? And it was actually pretty good about saying, okay, here's what the future state needs to be like. Here's what your key performance indicators mm -hmm. should be. Uh, here's how improvers could be put in the, in the path. Well, that's something I knew very innately by all the years that I have been doing this. But it was pretty interesting that, that it was able to give that back to me. But by no means is that chat GPT going to be the empathetic change agent that's necessary mm -hmm. to make sure that this comes to fruition in the company. You need people to gather your stakeholders, to gather the president from the truck driver, the warehouse, everybody that's involved, and get them involved and get them to buy in and get them to feel part of the solution. If you were just to throw out that solution to them, that's where you're going to, you're going to watch a mass exodus from your company because people won't deal with change that way. They need to feel like they're part of it. So that human factor of being critical thinking and that empathy for being that change agent, chat GPT is not going to, to, to take that role. It, it goes can't. back to those soft skills again, the exactly. interpersonal and intrapersonal goes, skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to that. So, but it's but there's a lot of there's some great value. It's a lot of fun to play with. It is. And, I, it's yeah. fascinating. Yes, it's, and there's some great skills there. Yeah, I mean it's a fantastic tool. Yes, that's and what it is. If right. you look at it that way, then it's not so scary. Uh, and I know for a fact I've I've actually been using ChatGPT for some writing skill or writing exercises that I've been going through, and it's it's a great way to mm -hmm. get things started. But mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't turn in. Exactly what it says, you know, but it's a it's a it's a it's a fantastic tool to get you rolling saying, okay, yeah, we change this around a little bit. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's great. It could be a great time saver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was just gonna say one other thing that I wanted to mention is that in a lot of our classes, when I've been sitting in on listening in on them, 
that question has been coming up a lot I lately uh, from students saying, hey, why am I ta- why am I bothering with this training? Because AI is going to take over. <laughs> and to, you know, 100%, the lecturers, which are typically our you know, industry executives, are saying the exact same thing. This is a tool, nothing more. Mm-hmm. It's just a new tool that we can use to help make our professional lives better. It's not going to be replacing people, at least not yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Healthcare certainly has opportunities for it and can make a physician or a nurse far more efficient in the moment. Uh, but hopefully we in, uh, engage with some policy that makes that safe and there's real humans evaluating that uh, that record before it advances. So ASU had an AIML conference uh, specific to uh, medical devices about two weeks ago. So I sat through that, came to find out that AI has developed to the point that it even invents its own studies, which are being referenced as legitimate data. And so an investigator, a, a clinician, a scientist needs to, to look into, okay, is, is this a real event yeah. or did AI just know the format of what a really great citation looks like mm-hmm. and it just injected its own results exactly. into the database, right? Yeah. So there's significant oversight that needs to be monitored closely. There's big, big consequences in, right. in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Oversight, uh, mm-hmm. ethics, privacy mm-hmm. issues, so all huge abound privacy. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. We have a little bit of time left, so I want to make sure we hear from each of you kind of what's next. And I think, Rob, it would be great to start with you. What is the future for AZ Next? And and again, how can we best support the program and or get more people involved? What's next for AZ Next? Let me start off by, uh, it's been about a little over a year since the last time Laura and I were on the program. At that point in time, we had just launched our first cohort yep. of business analysis, which Paloma was part of. Since that time, we have now over a dozen training programs that range anywhere from a two-day boot camp to a two-year apprenticeship. We have 1,261 participants who have enrolled. We feel we're just hitting our stride right now. Um, Our grant period is four years, so we're actually in the third year now. Uh, We do have the option of extending that an additional year, but it is ASU and our full intention to make this a permanent program. We are working with other organizations, other grants to partner with them so that we can gain more uh, of of those grant dollars. We're also looking to make our programs so value-added that our corporate partners will continue to sponsor us beyond the grant period. So we are looking forward to AZNX becoming a permanent uh, addition to ASU and look forward to training lots more people in the future. And you are the right guy for the job. I know that. Can you just speak a little bit about your background? We, I know we've, again, we've shared it on the previous episodes, but for those who are listening today for the first time, how did you land here? I have over 20 years of experience in the aerospace manufacturing realm. Uh, I did everything from program and project management, customer management, process development. After I finished my corporate career, I decided that I wanted to do something that gave back a little bit. Just so happened to line up that uh, AZ Next opportunity came up at ASU, and ASU was most definitely one of the targets that I wanted to go to after after, uh, finishing my aerospace career. Everything lined up. Stars were perfectly aligned. Uh, I had the skills that they needed and uh, was able to uh, get into ASU a little over two years ago now. Believe me, it's been a huge shock going from the corporate world to the academic world. But I'm starting to figure it out a little bit now. And um, again, looking forward to working with this uh, program for many years to come. So good. And I don't know that I've ever asked this before. Is this, to your knowledge, the first of its kind in the country? Or do we have some similar programs? There's lots of actual workforce development programs out there. This would be the first Department of Labor grant-funded program at least in Arizona, that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. But again, uh, it's it's one of the things that I've learned is that the workforce development area is vast. There's a right. lot of people out there doing a lot of different things. Kind of as what we discussed a couple of weeks ago with, uh, you know, the folks from Western Arizona College and uh, the Tucson, oh, now I can't remember. The, the but tech. Uh, yeah. Tech, yeah, Tucson Tech Institute. 
Uh, but no, I mean, we have, I mean, workforce development is important. 17, they did a survey and only 17% of high school graduates in the state of Arizona plan to go on to post-secondary college. What percentage? 17. That is not going to be enough for all the high-tech jobs that we've got coming to the valley or to the valley, to the state, to the region. We need these workforce development programs, all of them, because with all of the industry that's coming to Arizona right now, uh, there are going to be tons of jobs out there. They're all going to need to have training in these skills areas. And um, we need these types of programs. Is it cost prohibitive? Is that why that number is the way it is? I mean, the four-year degree. I think, yeah. I <laughs> mean, Laura's chomping at the bit they, there. <laughs> they did. They. I don't. They didn't really go into a lot of details from what I heard, but it's got to be. You know, the cost involved in a four-year college degree has obviously gone way high in yeah. the last few years. But I think a lot of kids coming out of high school are really just not thinking that it's going to be worth it to them to mm -hmm. invest that amount of time and money. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're looking for other options. Mm -hmm. and, and the options are more readily available yeah. than ever before, yeah. it seems. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And we need to break the paradigm. I yes. mean, you don't need to have a college degree to do all of these positions. Yeah. So that's why a, programs like AZ Next are around uh, to get people skilled up in these high-tech areas so that we can get them into these jobs and, uh, you know, improve our overall communities. Yeah. And I would love to give a shout out to that last episode we did with AZ Tech Council on their AZ Tech Cash Show. If you're listening and you're curious about, again, the way that the state is working, when I say the state, Arizona, our private sector, our public sector, our educational institutes, as well as our leg legislatures, we're all coming together really with great thanks to Steve Zalstra and the Arizona Tech Council and Arizona Commerce Authority to make sure we're providing enough opportunities for workforce development so we can continue to be a force to be reckoned with. So yeah. go listen to that episode when Rob is there with a couple of the other guests talking about this very conversation. Remind me too, if you would, Rob, how old do you have to be to participate? When What's the minimum age for AZ Next? The only requirements to participate in AZ Next is that you be 17 years of age or older and have a high school degree or diploma, uh, high school diploma or GED. Very good. Wonderful. Something that you want to add about that last little conversation we had around, uh, you know, high school kiddos moving into being ready and available for the workforce? Well, I think it's a general overall statement about the state of education in the state of Arizona in general. I mean, we all know that we are at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to our education systems in the United States. And the United States is not stellar when it comes to comparing it to the world. So I think we have a lot of work here to do in Arizona, and it starts in kindergarten, pre-K, and getting these kids involved in STEM and STEAM activities and getting that energy level going. As you know, I work with fourth, grader, fourth graders and their uh, and STEAM initiatives, and uh, just getting that enthusiasm going and keeping it going all the way through high school so that they are aware of all these different types of programs and that they're inspired to move forward with some initiative, some sort of training to get them to the next step. It starts very young and we need to do a better job. Yep. Constantly starting from the very early ages, mm -hmm. getting them interested in things beyond their laptop and their phone. <laughs> They're getting those much earlier. So well, how do you make that phone work? And <laughs> what's, what is all that uh, that makes it a big difference? And instead of what's, there, well, there's a term, uh, being a creator versus mm -hmm. someone who is uh, just taking advantage of the technology, right? I try to do or that with user. my 15 year old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of just using the technology, you, you have to spend more time on your devices that you're in creation mode versus just using and consuming mode. And mm -hmm. that, again, that doesn't go over very well <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> right. And yet it's driven him to be excited about the possibility of an engineering degree when he leaves high school, because now he sees, oh, I just not going to be the one who consumes. I can have a say in how to make these things work and how they can develop. But even making that available to some of these children, uh, we saw this particularly during COVID, these are children that are completely underserved in every area. They do not have income uh, level to support internet access at their home. So just trying to give these children internet access to attend their classes during the COVID was indeed a challenge. So if that's at basic level. Mm -hmm. So getting the technology in their hands to get that curiosity mm -hmm. is part of the struggle as well. 
Before we close out, I would love for you to just kind of give a shout out to Paradigm Solutions and the kinds of uh, companies and individuals you work with. And so that when people are listening, that they'll have an opportunity to reach out to you when they're a good fit or they know somebody who is. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, Yes, Paradigm Solutions is a consultancy and technology offering fractional and interim CIO support, as well as leadership in large initiatives. I've worked everywhere from million-dollar companies to Fortune 10 in large-scale initiatives. So that's my passion. That's my fun. I love shaking things up and bringing value to the organization. And as my saying goes, the technology, as we've been talking about, is just a tool. We just need to make, and it will do exactly what you tell it to do. Mm -hmm. And our job is just to make sure we tell it the right story. Mm. I've never heard you say that before. I love that. Well said. It very well said. Beautifully said. And it speaks to your characteristics and your, your distinguished personality and how you how you do things the way that you do it. Uh, speak a little bit more to that. If someone, again, were looking forward to working with you and, and, and making a difference in their organization, what's unique about Paradigm Solutions and you specifically? What, I mean, you've already spoken a lot about that. Just, mm-hmm. again, the, the career that you've had and the way in which you've shown up and the challenges that you've had been faced with. What else would you add to that? Well, I think some of you know I started off in special education. And so I don't know that I remember uh, that. my dream was to get my doctorate and build my old school before there was even a thing called a charter school. So that's kind of the foundation. And I quickly got just uh, enchanted with the school systems and I went into technology, which is where all the tests told me I should go. But I, I've, oh, I love the technology. To me, the technology is very straightforward. Like I said, just tell it the right story. Mm-hmm. To me, it's about the people and the processes. People, processes, technology in that order. So someone like me just brings that empathy with the 30 plus years experience and being able to bring those kinds of corporate goals to fruition. As far as my energy, obviously, that's that. I think that's just part of my DNA. And I challenge all organizations or, or companies out there to give back. We all have time where we can volunteer to, to speak at AZ Next or any or organization. Take that time for an extra phone call and be a mentor or just to give a little bump for enthusiasm. It, you never know where that that word or that that sentence might have impact to someone. So give back. Take the time. And to go back to our conversation around inclus- being inclusive and diverse, it helps broaden our neighborhood, so to speak. It helps us get a better feel for what's happening outside of our own back door mm-hmm. when we volunteer and we, and we show up in that way for our community. Excellent. Paloma, <laughs> what's next for you? What are, what are you doing these days? And, and um, how can we continue to support our military families? Right. Really because of AZ Next, I, I said it, this was my exploratory year or two. Um, I recognized that I still had some skills in the academic world, and I started a uh, master's in public leadership program, which actually the business analyst um, support really exposed me to, to the uh, learning technology platforms. And so I went in with the advantage of all my cohorts. I already understood the Canvas system that they had introduced me to. So that was, that made it a lot more comfortable transition. So I graduate in December of uh, this year. And really the the intent is to marry my nursing background, which which even on these conversations of workforce development and, and economic development, IT, all of these areas in, in my mind, I view it through the the lens of nursing because they're all contributing to the social determinants of health, right? So if we can line these things up on a policy level, public, for example, state, legislative, um, county, all kinds of opportunities for perhaps a nurse <laughs> to engage in that process. Um, actually, uh, you know, the, the purpose is for uh, optimal wellness, that we all live with that opportunity uh, to live the American dream and make ourselves as healthy a community as possible. I can get behind that. <laughs> yeah, that's beautifully said. Thank you. And uh, tell us again the the organization that you are a champion for as it relates to military families. Sure. So Hiring Our Heroes, Military Spouse Professional Network. And how do we get stay in touch with them? So we can uh, be found, uh, well, I can be found on LinkedIn. I'll always follow up that way. But on a broader scale, uh, Facebook hosts our private group. Luke at HiringOurHeroes.org uh, is the email address. This is a, little, a whole lot of letters. Uh, we'll get you to Facebook, right? 
So Luke AFB dash HOH MSPN. There are four questions that must be answered that you're willing to be polite, mostly, (laughs) if you join. As most Facebook groups are asking Um, you to do. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so if you can get through those four questions, um, yeah, you get access immediately. Good. And I see that you did provide that for us in our show notes. So we will have that link, hyperlink there for you as well. Very good. Anything else that I didn't think to ask you that you wanted to share around your experience with AZ Next or even just, you know, shout out to some of the folks that you're supporting? And Yeah, so I've already sort of thought through my graduation because it's keeping me motivated. And I just want to say out loud that I, there's so much of that these last two years that I'm carrying Laura with me through the process, and I want to make her proud. And I just want to express my gratitude for giving me a, a place to go with my concerns and my thoughts and my goofiness that um, she appreciates and helps me to refocus and keep moving forward. Mm. Thank you. (laughs) Incredible. And if I could add to that, I also want to thank Laura for her tireless volunteer work that she does with AZ Next. You make the program better. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's my pleasure. It's, 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 It's you nurture me, you give back to me. So I think it's a very symbiotic relationship here. <laughs> For sure. And and yet, you know, we you have a gift and, and you are sharing it in a beautiful way. And it doesn't come without some of the, the pains of the past when you're looking at some of the trials that you've had to go through. I know you and I have talked a little bit about that just from our own professional and personal perspective. So thank you for showing up the way that you do, because it clearly makes a a powerful impact and difference. And we need people like you. Paloma is on LinkedIn, Paloma Greenwald, W-A-L-D, at the end of the word green. (laughs) So we look forward to connecting with you there. And again, the Facebook.com group is Groups MSPN Luke. Does that sound right for the Facebook group? Can they find it that way? They can. I know you, I know you did it differently, mm-hmm. but this might be easier. M, M as in monkey, S, P, N as in Nancy. I know that I make up my own stuff. <laughs> and Luke, and then we'll make sure that we have it hyperlinked as well. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. It's an honor. I'm sure your, your husband and, and uh, boys and your extended family and friends are very proud of you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And how do we stay in touch with Laura? The best way is on LinkedIn. You can reach me there and feel free to message out to me or, like like I said, uh, book time on my calendar. Again, Laura Hemingway, H-E-M as in Mary, E-N as in Nancy, W-A-Y. And I wish I was related to Ernest, but sadly (laughs) Sadly, I'm not. (laughs) And is there anything else I hadn't thought to ask that you kind of came prepared to share today? No, just I just wanted to reinforce organizations to really think about the diversity within their organization and how welcoming an environment that is to everyone. And, uh, and also to shout out to my, to my colleagues to uh, challenge them to take that extra step and make sure and reach out and support. Mm-hmm. Love it. Rob, aznext.pipelineaz.com? Correct. Excellent. And I know you're on LinkedIn. I am on yeah. LinkedIn. And uh, you can also reach me at Rob. Dot B-L-O, B-U-E-L-O-W, at ASU.edu. Very good. Anything that I hadn't thought to ask you that you want to make sure that we cover today? I don't think so, other than just to echo what Laura had to say, uh, that we very much appreciate our corporate partners working with us on these programs. And if anybody else out there is interested, please contact me. We're happy to talk to you at any time. Yeah, it's just a conversation. Let's explore yeah. it together. Very good. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us on Phoenix Business Radio X today. We greatly appreciate your time. You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona. Some media leans left, some lean right, and we lean workforce development. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. Mm